Welcome to Longevity by Design, a podcast designed to give individuals access to the leading scientific information in the field of longevity. The ability to add years to your life and life to your years needs no opinion. Join us as we ask science to take the wheel. In each episode, Dr. Gil Blander joins a co-host and an industry expert in the field of longevity, shining a light and getting the answers to the key question, how can we live a longer, healthier life? Hello, I'm Ashley Reaver, and I'm joined by Dr. Gail Blander. Welcome to Longevity by Design, How to Live a Longer, Healthier Life. We're produced by Inside Tracker, your science-based guide to optimizing your body from the inside out. Our guest today is Dr. Matt Johnson. Dr. Johnson is currently the Director of Clinical Research at Dexcom and former Assistant Professor of Medicine at the Mayo Clinic College of Medicine. Dexcom is the leader in transforming diabetes care through development of continuous glucose monitoring systems for ambulatory use by people with diabetes and by healthcare providers. Dr. Johnson directs the clinical research for existing and new product development, including building capabilities for analytes beyond glucose. Dr. Johnson received his PhD in integrative biology from the University of California, Berkeley. Thanks so much for being here today. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you. So, uh, Matt, it's a great pleasure to having you with us today. Uh, you and I spent uh, numerous of hours talking about uh, CGM and uh, glucose and uh, other analytes. So it will be definitely fascinating for me, and I hope that it will also be fascinating for our audience. But, uh, we, would, but we would like to start from the beginning and uh, would like to learn more about uh, your history and background. And uh, if you can tell us, uh, give us some uh, background about how have you decided to become a scientist and what was your uh, pathway to where you uh, are today? Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, so for me personally, I was always interested in, in health and wellness as a, as a younger person, very active in athletics and sports. And initially thought I would actually follow more of a, the business track. And so when uh, I started in university, that was my bend. I was going to business school and wanted to be in the broader medical or health and wellness space. And then to my surprise, I, I took a couple of classes in science and, and that really appealed to me. And I think unlike most people, I, I took organic chemistry at UC Berkeley and I got an A. And that was, I think, a telltale sign that maybe something more in metabolism or biochemistry was, was my area instead of looking at the financial planning as a potential area of interest. So really since then, in my time at UC Berkeley, where I had some great professors in the nutrition department, as well as George Brooks in the integrated biology department that helped shape my career. And after I, I finished my undergrad and did my graduate work at, at Berkeley as well, I decided I wanted to apply that background into an area that could really impact healthcare in a big way. And for me, that was chronic disease management. So diabetes was, was top of mind, both in the work that I had been doing with George Brooks, as well as Professor Sharon Fleming at UC Berkeley. And so that's what led me to Mayo Clinic to get additional training in that area. It was a fantastic experience as well, because unlike many PhD scientists, I was able to be in the clinic. I was able to perform my own studies with human subjects, perform my own muscle biopsies, my own insulin clamps, really get hands-on experience uh, with human subjects. And ever since then, I've kind of never looked back. I've been following that, that area of human metabolism, chronic disease management, and really trying to, to work primarily in human subjects, although I, I have done quite a bit of research in the preclinical models as well. Fascinating. And uh, that's actually drive me to the next question. Uh, for the people that don't know what is CGM or continuous glucose monitoring, I would love to you to explain uh, what is that? Uh, what do you do at uh, Dexcom on that? And uh, also how uh, using a CGM transform the diabetes care? Yeah, absolutely. So CGM stands for continuous glucose monitoring. And 
It's a technology that has been under commercial development by multiple companies industry-wide for over 20 years. And the way it works is that it's a small wearable that an individual will wear. It has an adhesive that keeps a small subcutaneous sensor just under the skin. And that sensor is sensing that subcutaneous fluid. And for the products that are on the market today, they sense glucose uh, in that subcutaneous space. And we use algorithms to have that correlate to what your blood glucose is. So for primarily people with diabetes using this technology today, what they'll do is they'll apply this technology to their abdomen area or the back of their arm. People may start to see that as the technology become more prevalent. And they'll apply this once a week or every two weeks. And every five minutes or so, they'll get a glucose reading that will be sent to a handheld device, either a smartphone or a receiver. And for people with especially type 1 diabetes or type 2 diabetes, this is a way for them to continuously monitor their glucose levels. And especially for those who are looking to keep themselves out of severely low glucose or severely high glucose, it's a way to, to alert or alarm them if their glucose is going too low or too high. The technology right now is available globally by the major manufacturers, and it's a technology that's been growing exponentially over the last, call it five to 10 years, especially from the many manufacturers. Can you, can you uh, uh, Matt, uh, discuss volumes? Maybe how many of those, uh, whatever you can say, uh, how yeah. many of those were uh, produced? And if you look at a, a diabetic population, what percentage of them using CGM versus not? Absolutely, yeah. So today there's north of 5 million patients globally that are wearing the technology. So it's a lot of patients. It started with patients who have type 1 diabetes and especially those who were hypo unaware. So these would be patients that maybe could not detect when their glucose was severely low. And then from there, it really expanded into patients who are using insulin pumps. And beyond that, to patients using multiple daily injections of insulin. Today, we're starting to see this more broadly in, in patients who are on insulin, even those not on insulin. You see some companies in Europe, especially who are, are having athletes leverage the technology. Some very famous athletes are wearing the technology in Europe, especially. And what we see globally from an overall penetration rate, as far as the number of patients in that patient population who's using insulin, somewhere around 20 or so percent of those patients have access to the technology. And globally, though, it's still in the single digits for people with diabetes that have this technology at their fingertips. So that global scale of manufacturing is something that the industry is really working on. And of course, improving access through demonstrating both clinical evidence, market access, as well as uh, getting costs down. I get a lot of ads for CGMs on Instagram, <laughs> but they're not marketed towards people managing diabetes. They're kind of marketed towards general health and wellness communities, which I think is interesting. <laughs> Yeah, you, you, we have seen an explosion of those types of interests, and especially as the technology becomes easier and easier to use, uh, they're single-click applicators, uh, they're kind of plug-and-play with mobile apps and technology. We're seeing increased adoption in a lot of different areas, and the health and wellness uh, sphere, metabolic health, is definitely one of those areas where we're seeing a lot of interest, uh, both in Europe and in, increasingly in the United States. And most people are familiar with like the finger stick glucose monitors that or glucose meters, you know, maybe they've seen people in their life poking that and that's actually analyzing glucose in that drop of blood. But the CGMs are looking at something different, the analytes, not necessarily the glucose itself, correct? Yeah, so we're looking at glucose and the reaction chemistry is very similar. The difference is that when you take a finger stick, you're looking at capillary glucose. And so you're looking at that, that that drop of blood and the glucose in that drop of blood. What the sensors on the market today monitor is they monitor the glucose in the interstitial space. And so there is a, a slight lag between those two compartments. Mm. They are generally similar, but there is a lag between the two. And so what the companies do is we use an algorithms to correct for that. So we will, for example, in our clinical studies, draw blood. We'll also take capillary samples. 
And then we'll measure the interstitial glucose concentrations using our technology. And then we will apply correction factors in order to make the glucose look from our devices, the estimated glucose values. In fact, we call them that estimated glucose values because they aren't blood glucose measurements, uh, look like the blood glucose so that patients can make appropriate decisions off of the technology. Yeah. Interesting. And uh, uh, we discussed a few minutes ago about, uh, you mentioned that there are some super athletes that using it. And we, as you said, there are uh, a lot of, uh, uh, let's say normal people, let's say people that don't have diabetes that using uh, uh, um, CGM. So what, what is your opinion about it? Is it necessary? And what are the benefits of uh, using this technology today for a healthy person? Yeah, definitely. It's a great question and the one that we increasingly are getting. I think from the perspective of people learning about their health, learning about their body and understanding kind of what their normal looks like, I think that CGM technology is a great way to experience that. I mean, I'm somebody who doesn't have diabetes and when I first joined the company, it was one of the first things that I I did was I wanted to see what my glucose looks like and it was an eye-opening experience to to really see what that looks like. With that being said, I think some of the things that we're really learning about this technology as we are continuing to expand and more and more people are using it is that we're learning what does normal look like for somebody who doesn't have diabetes. In fact, we partnered with the JABE Center and published a study a couple of years ago on exactly that, establishing a baseline for what does it look like for people who don't have diabetes and what is their normal glucose because we're used to seeing a fasting glucose value if you go in to get a lab maybe if you're a female who's been pregnant you may have had an oral glucose tolerance test you may have your a1c measured every so often but when you start seeing five minute data collected over multiple days uh, it's it's really surprising what impacts your glucose and so I think that from a health and wellness perspective, it can be very insightful for people to understand how things like stress and sleep, different foods impact their glucose, different activities impact their glucose, uh, what that means clinically, and, and how, do we, how do we work with that information, I think is something that a lot of researchers are starting to look at, and we're starting to learn a lot more. And one of the exciting things to me is that as this technology is just becoming more and more readily available, we're going to go and collect that information. I mean, we have data coming into the cloud, different groups are able to share their data, patients are able to access their data and share it. And so it's a really exciting time for people to, to learn what their glucose looks like. Absolutely. And uh, in one of our uh, former discussion, Matt, we we discussed that that's just the tip of the iceberg in, in a way that uh, today is glucose, but uh, very soon we'll have a, a lot of other analytes that we can uh, measure continuously. Can you uh, elaborate a bit about that? Sure. Yeah. So, you know, one of the things that's been really exciting is, is watching how this technology not just the glucose sensing technology, but really the platforms to sense these subcutaneous analytes has, has matured. And what you're now starting to see are companies in the space announcing that the products beyond glucose are intended to be commercialized. So announcements have been made for things like ketones, things like alcohol, lactate, all of these sorts of analytes have been announced publicly. Uh, that they will be coming onto the market globally in the coming years is the intention. And I think that when you start to think about all those analytes individually and what people can learn about their bodies and also in conjunction together, they're really exciting possibilities for people to understand their metabolism like they've never understood it before. You're no longer seeing just a, a point in time reading, but you're starting to see what your daily activities, what your habits, what your behaviors, how those impact your individual metabolism. And people can then start to take action on that information. It's a really, really exciting time. Absolutely. And uh, my uh, follow-up question, which is not surprising, is when would we have that in uh, our Apple Watch, if ever? Yeah, well, it's there today, I think, but in, in a way that maybe people aren't as familiar. So some of the companies, like for example, Dexcom, does have the ability to take the data from the wearable, send it to your, your smartphone and then to the Apple Watch. So we do have mobile apps that are on those platforms and allow you to read it. I think that 
what you're alluding to though is is maybe some of these non-invasive technologies where you know apple for example people talk about may have the ability to read glucose from the watch those are technologies that we've seen a lot of companies attempt and there are a lot of companies that are continuing to explore that area there are some fundamental challenges that have yet to be overcome and i think that it's something that you know we will continue to keep our eye on i continue to keep my eye on that space as well but i think that from what i've seen publicly and published as well there's a lot of challenges to understanding that primarily because you're not making direct measurements of the analytes themselves but you're inferring concentrations of these analytes by looking at things like blood flow looking at things like the size of the capillaries and how that changes with concentrations of analytes and as any physiologist will tell you that can work when many things are controlled the environment's controlled people's behavior are controlled but as soon as you start running around as soon as you start moving the a lot of those assumptions start to fall apart and it becomes much more challenging to get a really reliable and accurate reading so i wouldn't rule out entirely but to date there is a very large graveyard of of companies that have been in that space and <laughs> and we continue to kind of watch and it's a lot of fun to see that technology move forward but as of today technologies like the subcutaneous sensing technology is definitely here and gives very very reliable readings exciting and i want to pivot us to diabetes which is what you know obviously cgms were created to help monitor Selfishly, I have a question before we start diabetes, and that's back to a healthy population. I feel as if oftentimes when people share their glucose readings, it's, you know, look at this one food that I ate that made my glucose spike the most. Our head of data science, she's doing one now, and it was blueberries for her that put her glucose at 187. She said that's the highest it's been all week. Do we know necessarily if the peak glucose that someone achieves is correlated in any way to foods they should avoid or try and combine in different things? Because historically, most of our glucose testing has been looking at insulin's response, basically how effective insulin is at bringing that back down. So now that the shift is kind of looking at the spike, as opposed to the response, what can we, do we know anything about that yet? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think, you know, so first off, I think there are a series of metrics that the people do look at and increasingly for people with diabetes we look at and they i think are reasonably applicable to a general population although we don't have kind of clinically defined metrics there yet so so things like yeah, time spent above certain numbers like 140 is a metric so somebody can can watch that what is it that spikes their glucose that high um, you can also look at average glucose it usually takes a couple of days to get to get a good reading on that but you know, if your average glucose is elevated, and that is something also that that we use to kind of understand glucose metabolism of somebody's risk as well. And then you can also look at things like standard deviation or glucose fluctuations. So typically, you'll see in people that don't have diabetes that they they have very stable glucose. So things that when they eat meals or when they perform different activities, their glucose homeostasis is very very stable and stays in a, in a relatively narrow range and understanding what may cause swings very high or very low or things that often can give insight into behaviors that, that people may want to adjust that's something that we work on you know with clinically with patients with diabetes but i think also has relevance for people who are trying to understand those glucose fluctuations and blueberries is a great example it's one that i remember in fact in my first year in working with the technology talking with some people who had type 2 diabetes and they had gotten access to the technology for the first time through one of our one of our studies and we were sitting and understanding how was it impacting them because back then it was really a small number of patients globally that had access to the technology and one of the individuals was a gentleman who had been diagnosed with type 2 diabetes you never would have guessed it by looking at him he was in his 50s but he was lean he ran marathons and the one thing he said that spiked his glucose more than anything were blueberries which i thought was quite surprising but then other people next to him were saying it doesn't do it to mine mine is mm -hmm. you know this other food and so learning about your individual biology and and physiology is quite illuminating and cgm is one of the technologies that will definitely do that for you and definitely will be exciting i think when 
I think it's super cool. Obviously, we're a personalized nutrition company and just how different everyone really is. The paper that came out in Cell a few years ago, some people pizza was the worst thing. For some, it was apples. It's crazy how it's just completely spread across the board. Yeah. Oh, and okay. So pivoting to diabetes, we know that there are some factors, some of them you just mentioned, that can influence in insulin sensitivity, like age, gender, certainly some nutrients that might be included in your diet exercise and so forth. But do we know what the strongest predictor of insulin sensitivity is, or do we have some sense of it? Yeah, well, I think the first thing is, is family history. So for people that have a family history of, of metabolic disease and diabetes, that's a very strong predictor. There are nuances to that. For example, people of Asian Indian descent, if they are new to, for example, America, they are at a much higher risk of developing metabolic disease and specifically diabetes. Beyond that, diabetes is very complicated because it's a multifactorial disease. So really, there are many tissues in the body that are responsive to insulin. The liver, the skeletal muscle, the adipose tissue or fat tissue. And in any one of those tissues, if they themselves become resistant to insulin, uh, can lead to abnormalities in glucose metabolism. So it's one of the reasons why we see such a large number of drugs on the market to treat diabetes from the pharmaceutical companies is that there's a large number of targets that can, in fact, improve glucose metabolism. And so when we start thinking about diabetes as a chronic disease, once you start controlling for people's family history, if you start controlling for people who, for example, have moved to a more Western society, then after that, it really comes down in large part to people's behavior and to the types of activities that they're performing. So, you know, we've demonstrated pretty well that weight loss and, and many can improve glucose metabolism. That's a primary defense against developing diabetes for those with prediabetes. Physical activity is another great way to uh, improve glucose metabolism. And in, in many regards, that those are the first line defenses for people that are at risk of developing diabetes. And it will, uh, in many cases, reverse the di diabetes or the progression towards type two, but in not all cases, some people still do develop diabetes. And maybe I should back up and ask for an explanation just for people that aren't familiar with the connection between insulin, how that actually impacts glucose metabolism. Sure. Yeah. So insulin is a very powerful hormone. There are pancreas releases from the beta cells. And once that insulin is released, typically in response to increasing glucose levels from a meal, what that insulin will do is it will dock on different tissues. So for example, in the skeletal muscle, it will cause that skeletal muscle to take up that glucose and store it and or use it for energy. In the liver, it will actually tell the liver to stop releasing glucose into the bloodstream. And in the adipose tissue, it, it tells the adipose tissue to stop releasing free fatty acids into the bloodstream because there's glucose available. Those are some of the primary effects of insulin. And what happens in, in people with type 2 diabetes is that the effect of insulin uh, is less. So for any given amount of insulin, that glucose lowering effect to dispose of glucose into the skeletal muscle, into the liver, to tell the liver to stop releasing glucose, to tell the fat tissue to stop releasing free fatty acids, all of those effects are blunted. And so it takes more insulin to produce the same effect in those individuals that are developing insulin resistance. And when the body's uh, not producing enough of that insulin in order to bring that glucose down, that's when we start to develop what we call clinically diabetes. And for individuals that are pre-diabetic or perhaps starting to develop some of that insulin resistance, you mentioned weight loss and exercise being two really effective ways to prevent that progression. Is there a difference that you see between effectiveness of exercise or even dietary changes between men and women that do make changes to their diet or do start exercising more? Does it impact one gender more than the other? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think first off, both exercise and caloric restriction are great ways to improve glucose metabolism. As far as, as gender differences, you know, 
women tend to respond very favorably to caloric restriction. And that's something that we've seen in our research. Um, exercise is effective as well. But what we've found is that especially in women who are overweight and that that may be driving some of their insulin resistance, uh, losing that excess body fat can be very effective. In one study that we performed in younger and older men, we found that those that were chronically endurance trained, those that had exercised for a long period of time, that basically their insulin sensitivity was identical to a 20-year-old that was of similar fitness. So exercise can be very effective, and we've definitely demonstrated that in, in men, absolutely. So, uh, Matt, uh, related to hormones, we discuss insulin. There is uh, another metabolic-related hormone that's called ghrelin, and it's uh, have been uh, shown to regulate uh, insulin sensitivity and, uh, and so on. What what is the relationship of ghrelin for uh, type two diabetes? And uh, uh, I know that you've done some research on that, so would love to pick your brain about that. Yeah. So I think. Ghrelin, as well as many of the other hormones that are identified to impact glucose metabolism, are an exciting area of, of research. So one of the things that can impact glucose metabolism is when ghrelin levels are elevated, and ghrelin can negatively impact insulin sensitivity and can lead to abnormalities in glucose metabolism. And what we're seeing now are that some of the newer drugs that are on the market, especially the GLP-1s and some of the other drugs that acted historically through some of those mechanisms to impact some of these other hormones like DP DPP-4 inhibitors, that when you modulate some of these secondary hormones, that you also see improvements in, in glucose metabolism. Excellent. Um so, so we would like to discuss a bit about uh, mitochondria, uh, VO2 max, and aging, which is a, a very a favorite uh, um, subject for me, and I know that also for you. So maybe before we'll start, can you explain to our uh, listener what is a, a mitochondria and uh, why is it important uh, uh, for uh, exercise and longevity? Oh, certainly. Yeah. So mitochondria are the powerhouse of our metabolism, of our cells. So any oxidative metabolism, which is the primary way that our body produces energy, occurs in the mitochondria. And what's really exciting is that mitochondria have been linked both to healthy aging as well as to genetics. So individuals who have healthy mitochondria, a lot of mitochondria, we call it a high mitochondrial content, are individuals that not only typically exhibit a very healthy metabolic profiles, but if you look at elite athletes, for example, if you take a muscle biopsy of, a, of an elite athlete and you isolate the mitochondria and you look at their number, so how much there is, as well as how well they function, they typically are two to three times more as far as the content and the, their ability to consume substrates are extremely high. So their ability to consume fatty acids, glucose, lactate, those sorts of substrates are extremely, extremely high. And what is the relationship between mitochondria and uh, VO2 max? Yeah, so they're, they're basically uh, linked. And if you look at somebody's VO2 max and you overlaid and, re and did a regression against their mitochondrial content, you would see that somebody with really low mitochondrial content would also have very low VO2 max. And somebody with a very high mitochondrial content typically will have a very high VO2 max and very high performance. And are, is that present from birth or is that something that mitochondrial content increases with training or environment as well? Yeah, so we, I am not aware of a study that have, has really looked at mitochondrial content in children. That may be something that I just, I'm not aware of that study. Maybe others will be able to pull that out. But I know that at a young age, children typically have very high aerobic capacities and for their size and body weight, they have relatively high VO2 maxes. Once we start to get into the teenage and young adult years, what we see is that those that are regularly exercising have very high mitochondrial content 
And if you maintain that level of activity, you can also maintain that level of mitochondrial content throughout age. So we've done studies in individuals into their 70s. And if they're regularly exercising and performing aerobic exercise, either exclusively or as part of their overall exercise program, they can have mitochondrial content that is similar to those individuals who are in their 20s. But it's something that if they stop exercising, either voluntarily or maybe because they become injured or sick in some way, it's something they can reverse rather quickly. So and on the order of, of um, weeks to months, you can see declines mm -hmm. in mitochondrial content if you take people and stop them from exercising or if they're admitted into the hospital. Mm -hmm. These are things that can cause rather severe declines in mitochondrial content, as well as aerobic capacity if you measure it at the VO2 max level. Is it, is it a specific uh, intervention of exercise? Namely, today, uh, HIIT or high intensity interval training is really in fashion. And there are some people that are saying that that's the best one. Is it the one that also increased the mitochondrial content? Yeah, so it's a great question and definitely hit is very popular these days. Um, so people have definitely demonstrated that using high intensity interval training, you can increase mitochondrial content. We actually demonstrated that when I was at Mayo in both the young and older individuals that a hit type protocol can increase mitochondrial content. Uh, but aerobic endurance training is also very effective at increasing mitochondrial content and I think when you think about it from a personal level, it's, it really should be taken into consideration with what that individual wants to be doing. So exercising at say 50% of your VO2 max or 60% of your VO2 max, which may be something what we call kind of the talk test when people can still be exercising and holding a normal conversation, but any harder than that, it would be challenging to have that conversation. That's a very effective workload for 60 to 90 minutes for an exercise session that will result in dramatic improvements in mitochondrial content. And likewise, a, a HIT style exercise for those that are interested in that type of activity will also result in increases in, in mitochondrial content. So I think that from a, from a physiology perspective, both kind of activate the same cascades inside the body to, to result in improvements in mitochondrial content, but it really kind of comes down to that individual and what excites them and what they'd like to be doing for exercise. And since your VO2 max, as you mentioned before, really does track with mitochondrial content, the higher or more that you have, typically the better someone's VO2 max would be. Do we know if VO2 max was used as an independent predictor for any age-related diseases? Yeah, so VO2 max or a surrogate for VO2 max will be used in many cardiovascular labs and for cardiovascular rehabilitation to track people who are at risk of, of reoccurrence of a cardiovascular event and for training purposes in order for them to improve their overall function. And that's something that, that is typically done at the hospital in a lab and what they're really looking to do is if people have very low cardiovascular function, very low um, VO2 max, that really puts them at risk of doing activities of daily living, which if you're unable to get up, walk around the house, do your daily activities, the risk for further complications for that individual are extremely high. Um, and likewise, we also see people on the other end of the spectrum, elite athletes who are measuring those parameters. And while they're not always predictive of their overall performance in a given event, for example, if you take the highest VO2 max, that's not going to predict who's going to win the Tour de France or a given race, but it does help when elite athletes are trying to put their training programs together. It's one of many parameters that they may be using for their training. And uh, Matt, you said that aerobic activity can uh, improve uh, VO2 max. Any other intervention that uh, can improve it other than uh, aerobic activity? Yeah, other than that, uh, the, what we have seen in people who are very untrained is that some form of resistance training as well can help to build a base level of strength on which they can then improve their aerobic capacity even more. So if you take an individual who's highly untrained and just provide them with 
aerobic training, you will not see as much of a benefit as it. Instead, if you take that individual and you do some resistance training, build up some base level of strength, and then on top of that, add on aerobic training. So in those situations, you can see improvements in VO2 max that exceed what you would otherwise have seen with aerobic training alone. And in past podcasts, we've talked about bone mineral density, as well as muscle mass being things that peak much earlier in life and can stay elevated if they're higher earlier. Is there anything like that with VO2 max? Like if you were active through your teens and 20s, are you more likely, even if you stop that level of activity, to have a higher VO2 max later in life? Yeah, absolutely. So people that are active at a young age generally are at a lower risk for a lot of different diseases, chronic diseases, and you see that also reflected in their physical fitness. So if people have been active in the past and they decide that they want to take it back up after a period of time when they haven't been as active, you can see them typically respond quite well to that activity. They, there is some effect from that early training in their ability to recuperate that ability later on in life. Absolutely. That's super interesting. Another plug for having kids be active. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So, so uh, we discussed uh, uh, earlier today a bit about caloric restriction. And by the way, that's one of my uh, favorite subjects. And uh, uh, there is a lot of buzz in the uh, um, in the longevity field about caloric restriction. And actually, I think tomorrow we'll release a, a full episode that uh, we discuss caloric restriction in human and uh, what is it doing, what is the easiest uh, way to do it, and so on. Um, the question that uh, I would like to ask you as an expert in uh, exercise and uh, mitochondria is uh, what is the effect of uh, caloric restriction on uh, uh, the mitochondrial uh, uh, function, specifically in uh, skeletal muscle? Yeah, that's a great question. So I can answer that in, in, in two ways. So one of them is really interesting when you study mitochondrial function and caloric restriction in skeletal muscle is, is that if you think about individuals losing weight and how the body preserves certain tissues and in some cases, certain functions over others, mitochondria are one of the things that are highly preserved. So one of the things that, that we demonstrated was that if you take mice and you calorically restrict them, that they'll lose body fat, they'll lose, in some cases, some of their lean mass, they'll preserve their mitochondrial function. And in fact, if you take those mitochondria and you respire them, or you take them out of the skeletal muscle and you test how well they function in, in these mice, at least we were able to demonstrate that their function improved compared to mice that had not been calorically restricted. So there's a very strong biological mechanism that preserves skeletal muscle mitochondrial function. When we looked at that in humans, we didn't quite see that, but it may have been that the, the time frame over which we were calorically restricting the humans was, was not as long as what we saw in the mice because we were able to do it throughout their entire life. Whereas with humans, it was about a four month time period. But there's a very strong preservation of mitochondrial function. And in some cases, you even see an improvement in mitochondrial function with caloric restriction. And that's, I think, uh, indicative of just how important that organelle is in our biology and in healthy aging. Our bodies really protect mitochondria and their ability to, to function. Very interesting. And how about caloric restriction in relation to insulin sensitivity and its implications for type 2 diabetes? And past just caloric restriction, meal timing is something that often is Feel like coupled with caloric restriction with the popularity of intermittent fasting yeah. what do we see kind of looking at it in those respects yeah so in humans we see that caloric restriction is a really powerful way to improve insulin sensitivity and one of the things that that we definitely see is improvements in for example example liver function so that responsiveness of the liver to insulin dramatically improves with caloric restriction. We also see in many studies that improvements in skeletal muscle insulin sensitivity, and we see increased responsiveness of the adipose tissue to caloric restriction. Now the modality of caloric restriction and intermittent fasting, I think is something that we've seen in 
quite a few studies that it will improve all of those aspects of insulin sensitivity. And the improvements are throughout all of those different tissues. So your liver insulin sensitivity, skeletal muscle, as well as adipose, all have a very strong effect to caloric restriction. And, and I think that speaks really to the benefits of those types of approaches if somebody's trying to improve their metabolic profile. And uh, Matt, if someone wants to uh, reduce the chance of him uh, having diabetes, are there a specific food items that you'll recommend uh, this person to consume more in order to uh, reduce the chance of uh, acquiring diabetes in the future? Yeah, when it comes to specific diets, I think for me, uh, what we found to be most effective is keeping it simple. So things as much as possible that are, are kind of straight from the farm to your plate, I think are is a great way. So lots of fruits and vegetables. Some individuals, you know, choose to eat a large amounts of meats. And if they do, I think that choosing meats that are lean and are really great, great things to be doing as well. And I think if you focus on that, those whole food diets that have high amounts of fiber, high amounts of nutrients, that's typically what we find to be the most effective for people to maintain their weight. But as we discussed at the beginning, you know, it's also highly individual. So I think learning what it is that works for an individual and monitoring their own metabolome, whether that's glucose or A1C and learning about their family history and the individual responses is something that's increasingly accessible for people and can be very informative as to which foods are ones that their body responds favorably to, and then using that information to tailor their own specific nutrient needs and their own diets. And they can be highly individual as, as the example of the blueberries at the beginning. Uh, you know, that may not be a food for some people, whereas other foods that don't spike their glucose may be ones that, that they want to consume more of. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, my example with the CGM is that actually uh, when I consume oatmeal, my uh, uh, glucose spikes significantly. But then when I thought about it, I said, hey, but holistically, oatmeal have a lot of uh, fiber. So it might spike my glucose, but it might help my inflammation and my uh, 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 lipids and so on. So it's I don't think that uh, uh, if, if I, I if I can gain uh, give a grain of salt, you shouldn't look only on the glucose. You should look at the holistic picture and uh, be careful not to take uh, too much uh, a conclusion from uh, only one analyte because we have thousands of analytes in our body and it's uh, it's a bit dangerous to come and say, hey, blueberry, because blueberries spike her, uh, her, her glucose, uh, it doesn't mean that she shouldn't eat glucose. Uh, sorry, blueberries mean that uh, she, it's good for her to know, but uh, uh, don't don't change too much just by glucose. Absolutely. And, and you can also use those to your advantage. You could have your oatmeal before you go for a bike ride. And, you know, people can see the impact of physical activity, which in and of itself causes glucose to be cleared from the body. So that's something that, that you know, people with diabetes have actually learned using this technology years ago, that they can have behaviors, for example, physical activity that can help control their glucose. And so these are things that as people learn more and more about their individual metabolisms that they can take advantage of. That, that's a very good point. And uh, I have a, a follow-up question for you about sleep. So we, we've seen a lot in the literature that actually when you sleep better, your glucose maintenance is better. Do you see this data also from the CGM? We do actually, yeah. We see that people that have longer periods of sleep, that their average glucoses are actually lower. So I think that sleep is one of those one of those behaviors that many of us in modern day society, you know, we really lack our sleep, and getting enough of it is absolutely correlated to glucose levels and something that, if you can improve the quality of your sleep, will likely have an impact in the positive. Piggybacking off of that, you mentioned stress similarly earlier in the podcast. If you eat the same food, but you're super stressed once or at one time and not at the next, your glucose can also respond pretty differently. Yeah, and we've seen that too. One of the things that was observed early on wearing the M-type technology is that in certain situations, if you do enter into a stressful environment, it, it may be a presentation, it may be, you know, 
an extreme exertion, physical activity. In all of those instances, you can often observe increases in glucose levels. And it's quite surprising to, to see that. And then you, you may realize that, oh my gosh, my, yeah, I am in a, quite a stressful situation, but it absolutely, you can see increases in glucose levels with acute stress. And those are increases, even if you're not eating, you'll see a spike. That's right. Yeah. You'll see that. And that's probably due to your liver releasing glucose in a fight or flight type response. And that will manifest itself in your glucose levels. And if you're wearing a CGM type technology, I, you will see that increase. Another good piece of tangible data to tell you to stop being a type A stress ball, if you can. <laughs> <laughs> well, you gave, you've given us so much good advice on diet as well as sleep and stress we threw in there at the end, but is there a top tip that you'd recommend to improve lifespan or more importantly, maybe health span that you would mind sharing with our listeners? Yeah, I think the, you know, the one thing that I've learned is that being physically active and finding ways to do that in a healthy and happy way is really one of the keys to success, I think, in in making it a long, lifelong habit. So if an individual can find ways that they like to be physically active, that has ramifications throughout the rest of their day and week. And I think that they'll find that it can also feed into then what it is that they're eating, how their other relationships manifest as well. All of which when you take into account all the things we've talked about from stress and sleep and all of that, if, if people are physically active and doing so in a way that makes them happy, I think that's a fantastic secret over the years when I've worked with individuals and we've studied them, especially people that have chronically exercise trained, maybe runners or cyclists, or they may be other avid athletes, rowers as examples. Those that can consistently have decades and decades of exercise under their belts, you find that they usually are, are very happy. They have the ability to refrain from behaviors that are oftentimes deleterious to their nutritional health. And it helps them sleep at night and maintain healthy relationships because they bond with individuals over those activities and sports. So I think that's one of the things that I think I've noticed over the years is, is that more and more people that produce those types of habits see that it reverberates throughout the rest of their life and helps them age in a healthy manner. Awesome. Great tip. Thank you for sharing. And thank you, Dr. Matt Johnson for joining us on the podcast today. It was really awesome to get to learn from you and speak with you. Oh, happy to join, thank you. And we look forward to exploring the research in the field of longevity each month with you and the leading scientists. For more information, please go to www.insighttrager.com slash podcast. Thanks for listening to Longevity by Design. Please subscribe to this podcast on Apple, Spotify, or YouTube. Longevity by Design is powered by Inside Tracker, a personalized health optimization platform that helps people improve their lives by improving their bodies from the inside out using personalized, science backed recommendations for nutrition, supplements, and lifestyle changes. To learn more, visit insidetracker.com/podcast.